Wow, I'm blessed. I got the gold mic. Hey, where's the group? Stand up. The group, all of you. Today, today, God took you into another realm of praise and worship. The higher the realm, the higher the standard. Somebody also said new levels, new devils. But that ain't no big thing because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is part of the group. God has spoken to our ministry, to this house. And he spoke to me very clearly a year and a half ago. And he spoke to me and he said, I want you to begin to raise this house as a generational church. And so we've begun to bring in the younger generation. This group has some tremendous mentors and they have a spiritual pastor over them that is on them like bees on honey so that they can stay straight. Their grades are important. Their attitudes are important. And I'm telling you, I am a very very proud pastor this evening. Thank you. Let's let them know how much we appreciate their faithfulness to what God has called them to do. I want to thank you for coming to church today. Are, are all of you happy? Thank you so much for coming. I, I, I'm, I've been really excited about today. I've, I've, I've been believing God for a tremendous service. We have a, a tremendous crowd. Why don't you give yourselves a great big round of applause? And I know the devil fought you to get here, but you got here. Can you say amen? Amen. Well, uh, can we please stand I'm, I'm about to introduce to you somebody that is very special in my life, um, but more special than him is his wife, it is of my opinion, but, but that's just my opinion, it doesn't matter. We love Louisa, we love Ed. Ed has been an, an encourager to this ministry, and when he comes, he speaks into the heart of this ministry, he really does. He really cares for this ministry. Now, this is a man that is uh, uh, very often sought out as, as a guest speaker. And the churches he goes to are, are phenomenal. They're not better than this church, but they're phenomenal. And, and because this is the best church on this side of the Western Hemisphere. Oh, yes, it is. You don't see it yet, but you just give God, give God some time and wait to see what he does. Anyway, um, I love when God brings people, and there's not very many that'll come to this church and really speak into the hearts of this church. Open, open your hearts, listen with your spiritual ears, get ready to receive in your spirit what God has for you. Because only one word from God, just one word from God, can turn your whole situation around. So turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, just one word from God can turn your whole situation around. So don't be talking to me, neighbor. Don't be texting on your phone, neighbor. Don't be talking out loud to the other guy behind us. I cannot be distracted. Come on, tell them. I cannot be distracted. I need to hear from God. I came to hear from God. So just leave me alone, neighbor. Now give the Lord a praise and please welcome Prophet Ed Trout. Hallelujah. Sit down, family. Woohoo! Take, take your seats, family of God. Yeah, I've been coming here a long time. 
So I was trying to work out how long, it's definitely more than 20 years, no question. I know you may have heard this from me before, but I want to start out telling you tonight what and who you are that you understand the relevance and importance of your life. God, in His greatness, made and created billions of angelic beings, all different levels, all different kinds. We think angels have a pretty looking long dress beings with big wings, not so. They can take on any form and shape and they move through space and time. They have extreme power. They can move planets if they have to. They're that powerful in different levels that God has made. We have a telescope that circles our Earth called the Hubbard Telescope, which some time ago was directed and pointed into a black hole that they had debated so long with it whether or not to do this. And they found in the black hole, which they didn't know what to expect, thousands of universes and galaxies in that tiny black hole, which tells us that we can't even count how many universes are around us. Ours is one of the smallest there is. We only have a few planets and one sun. So many others have much more planets than we do. And this huge God, this powerful God, has all these angelic beings that help him run this, these universes and do his bidding. But in his effort to have a relationship, he elevated one and gave him power and especially a free decision. And he chose to rebel against God and enticed, convinced one entire third of this vast angelic host to follow him. And so for the first time in the history of God's creation, God did something different. Having created so many angels, for the first time God didn't create another being, he took his very own DNA and reproduced himself. But in order to have a relationship, he took that DNA, because you are spirit, and he incarcerated, he kept it in a carbon-made body, made from the planet. He took the carbon and he made a house that was temporarily made just to have your spirit, which is immortal, inside of that body. So in the duration on the planet, we'd have a time to get to know him. And so in the Garden of Eden we read there are two trees that are named, there are many trees. One was forbidden, one was allowed, the tree of life was freely available. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not available. You have to ask yourself, why would God keep knowledge from us? When in fact he educated or enlightened Adam to the level that he could run an entire planet and name the animals and run the earth. It was enough knowledge or certain knowledge that God wanted to keep from him so that it wouldn't pollute or slow down the relationship that God was very slowly and gradually building. He was building with Adam because Adam had to have free choice. It had to be, he wanted Adam himself to choose God, not to be forced to feel under any compelling. So he came every day, God did, in the cool of the day. God doesn't have days. He waited for Adam's 24-hour cycle, and it wasn't in the morning where the whole day was ahead of him, or in the middle of the day when it was warm, or even late at night when he was trying to sleep. But in the very enchanting, comfortable, pleasant time of the evening, he came for a short spell, for a short sliver every day to fellowship and build a relationship with Adam. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was kept from him because it only would pollute the very first thing that Adam and Eve realized was they were naked, which had no bearing on their relationship, so irrelevant. When you understand that you are spirit, and this carbon house that you live in, being naked is of no consequence whatsoever. And the evil one used information to corrupt, to try and deter you from God. So here you are, born of a man and woman, whatever circumstance you were born in, and you grew up as a child, not knowing just whatever you'd be taught and not knowing what lays ahead of you. You go your life through trying to find your way through school and then onto a career and you get married or have so many relationships, who knows, and struggle trying to find the Lord and then you have your own children and then you get old and you die. It seems like a very strange and futile journey. But in that journey, which is an immortal spirit that you have inside of you, God reaches out to you, giving you every opportunity to know him and choose him. Now, in your life, you have so many challenges because we live in an environment with so many things going on. We just had two hurricanes of 
enormous proportion hit our nation and Christians are quick to jump to God being judgmental or dealing with us. God is not that petty to play chess games with his people. You are too important. Storms happen. We had hurricanes hit this nation long before anyone lived here. Then who would God be punishing then? It's so illogical to have that nonsense. The rain falls on the righteous and on the unrighteous. The rain falls. It rains. It rains. Storms happen. Do not confuse that with consequences of our lives. We make bad decisions. But anybody, Christian or non-Christian, what you sow is what you reap. All of us are like that. We have to know. We have to deal with consequences in our lives. But God is not in the punishment theme at all. He may correct you. You don't punish someone to correct them. You correct them for their benefit to help them stop hurting themselves. You don't punish them. That's not the ways of God. And if you knew him, you would understand that. God allowed us to be ignorant and have religion and legalistic patterns to guide us because we didn't understand any other language but now as we grow and become more available in the last hundred years we have grown education and technology wise more than thousands and thousands of years for thousands of years the horse was the main transport system with a steam engine now we have so much going for us and each day it goes faster and faster my watch has more memory in its my watch than in the Apollo 13 that went to the moon Things have advanced at a rapid speed and we are constantly, and that's why, why the things are changing all the time. And the enemy uses that stuff to get you. Now the devil doesn't want you to have a relationship with God. Why? It's very simple. Because not one angel, not even Satan, as beautiful as he is, was worth saving. You, on the other hand, are to die for. God didn't save one angel, but if you were the only person, he would have died for you. Those angelic beings sinned once. They rebelled against God, and a lake of fire awaits them. You sinned more than once today. Don't look at me like that, please. Now, please understand. Get things in perspective. Serving God isn't trying to be sinless and blameless, because that's futile. It's like being on diet. When you're on diet, all you think about is food. I wonder if I eat this, how many points I've left for the day. You'll always, <clears throat> you're always counting, and if you're trying to fight sin, that's all you think about is sin. But if you understand that God is holy, and if you want to be sinless, or without blame, then God being holy, He was holy long before there was ever sin. So if you want to be holy, you have to want more of Him. And your appetites will change. You don't have to try and work out your diet. If you fix your appetites, you won't eat the wrong stuff. It's the same spiritually too. And the devil gets you all focused on how bad you are. That's why Jesus died. Because there was just no other way. There was just no... So now let's not waste his death and suffering for our lives. Do you understand? Hallelujah. Now, God saved you. Not one of you in this room by accident. God saved you. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And some of you are, some of us in this room are severely messed up. We do well and we fall and we get up again. A righteous man falls seven times, but he keeps getting up. And we are, and we are of the righteous, we are of the, that get up crowd. So I'm here to ask you as this church, and I've always loved this church. I was startled many years ago, your pastor got up and said, for interest's sake, how many have ever been to jail? And more than half the church got up. <laughs> and I went, OMG. And, but I realized that's who God focused on. Yeah. Jesus didn't die for the good people. Yeah. 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 Where sin abounded, did grace abound more freely so God is very focused on struggling he wants you to be redeemed that's why I'm so grateful you came tonight because you made an effort to get here I know you're tired you've worked all day sometimes it's a real effort and costly to get here but don't miss the gathering you can't listen to it on the radio get the CD it's not the same you have to be here you never know what's gonna happen if you might just miss something supernatural now tonight I'd like to teach if you'll let me 
because you're born again and your name's the book of life, I know that you know that God loves you and he's not a respect of people and he loves everybody. But it's very clear that God has been attracted to people differently. Some people he paid special attention to. Enoch became his friend. And he had a whole different focus on different people all the time. And don't you want to be attractive to God? Don't you want to be appealing to the Lord? I'm going to teach you eight things that are appealing to God in man. From the scriptures, if you'll, if you'll make notes, you will make notes. Now's the time to start because I'm about to get the show on the road, y'all. <laughs> All right, before I do, let me just tell you very briefly that <clears throat> years ago in South Africa, where I come from, the Rhema, a very big church, they called me and showed me a letter that had been written to every church in the nation called Christians Against Apostasy. I was the main topic, and they called me a false prophet. Because I had predicted that when Mr. Mandela and transition would take place in 94, that there would be a peaceful and quiet transition, whereas many prophets had come from other nations and in their nation had predicted blood in the streets and riots and war. And there was a great apprehension by many pastors, and many had left. So when he called me in, this one Rhema pastor said, look at this, have you seen this? And now that the transition has taken place and Mandela's in power, and there's not one murmur, not one sound, not one single thing happened, not anything could be reported in the news about anything. No one apologized that you were right. And I'm telling you this not because I want to show you that the Lord uses me or that I speak the word of the Lord, but to tell you that I don't prophesy politics very often, but my wife, when she told me the day that the president was going to run for office, I said, he will win, he will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hillary Clinton, and he'll be known as the best president in the last hundred years. Because he'll fight for righteousness and Christianity. But wait, and when he becomes, takes office, an awakening will begin in the nation once again. And the church will come alive and again the, has fallen asleep. Because Jesus said that men, while men slept, the enemy sowed seeds. And the nation has gone to hell in a handbasket because the church fell asleep. But the church is in a great awakening at the moment throughout the nation. And this is what the Lord told me. And this is what I'm all telling you all this for. He, he said to me, this is his, the Lord's words to me. He said, beware that the church will become large and noticeable and will make an acclaim in this nation again. But the only half the church will be the real church. I said, why, Lord? Because the other half will look just like it but deny the power thereof. So I jumped and said, oh, you mean they're not going to allow the Holy Ghost to flow? The Lord said, no. The devil copies everything, even signs and wonders. The real power of God, and it startled me when he said it, is the transformation of a life. Wow. Transformation of a life. If people's lives aren't being changed as they are in this church, the power of God's not here. And I'm telling you all this because today at lunch I heard a startling thing out of the mouth of your pastor. Your pastor is one of the most amazing pastors I know. I'll tell you the truth, he is. It's, and you know, whenever they, you always see the glamour of the pastor and how wonderful he dresses and so on, but they are always attacked. They violent. The devil it doesn't just leave you. You know, when men, all men speak well of you, Beware. That's what Jesus said. So the devil will do all he can to attack you if you are a danger. But he said today at lunch, he was telling of a person that took an offense at a comment he made about sin or things that are unacceptable in God's word. And this person had left, but the person who was offended for them too said, well, they left, but they were so comfortable in your church so long in their lifestyle of sin. And that's what then pastor said, well, that's very concerning to me that in our church, someone can be that comfortable in their sin. That means we're not functioning correctly. And that immediately brought to my attention what the Lord had said, that a real church, the real power of God, is when lives are being transformed. And you may think it's strange, but I've watched this church over more than 20 years, and many people in this room, I've watched you transform and grow and fall, and get up again and become strong in the Lord. And that's all. It, it's how you finish it counts, not how you start. So don't be 
frowning or whining about your fall, just get up. You know, the Lord's already, before you were saved, accommodated all your falling. Do you know that? He told Peter, he said, the devil's asked to sift you. He, and I prayed for you, your faith wouldn't fail. And he says, no, Lord, I'm willing to go to prison for you. He said, Peter, before the night's through, you'll deny me three times. And when you come back, he hadn't fallen yet and God already restored him. So let me tell you, God's not stressed about your weaknesses. He hates wickedness. The gossip, the slander, the judgment, hates that. But if he's struggling, he's got compassion for you. He'll forgive you every time you repent, every single time. If it's a hundred times a day, he'll keep forgiving you. Are you hearing me? All right. Okay. Now let's read. The first thing I want to tell you that attracts God, God's very attracted to humility. I've found people that are full of sin or struggling that are humble. God cannot leave them alone. People that are not without, with people that are free and doing great things in the Lord, but they are prideful. God resists them. Wow. He lifts the humble, but he resists the proud. Yeah. God is attracted to humility. There's no conditions to it. It's just humility. But do not think humility is easy to obtain. Every one of us struggle with pride on different levels and different forms. If you think you're entitled to a certain treatment or recognition, that's pride. Nothing, nothing that we have is what we are right to. We have no right to anything. Everything's a gift and a blessing of God. And now that once again, we talk about my hero. He often says, get in the, there in the office. I am so grateful to God for my sons. He always says, I'm grateful. He always continually says, am I right? Pastor, uh, what's your name, Linda? Linda yeah. <laughs> He's always grateful. He says it continually. And that, I'm telling you, you've got a champion pastor and wife. Let me tell you, they are amazing people. You better appreciate what you have. Now, thankfulness and humility are inseparable. In America, we have a Thanksgiving Day, thank God. We have one nation in this world that gives thanks to God a whole day that, that is devoted to the Lord, not just for turkey, but pumpkin pie. Kids, don't bother me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Kids, don't bother me. When you stress like that, the kid gets more stressed. <laughs> you laugh, but let me tell you, God wants our children to be in church. Yes. And if we always make kids feel uncomfortable and unhappy, now we're going to tell you, you better behave. Don't you? You're going to get a spanking. You better, no, don't do that. Church mustn't, mustn't hate church. They must love church. Do you understand? And if someone else is kid irritating you, get over yourself. Because the mother gets so tense right away and that child feels it right away and gets worse. So just, just take it down a notch, right, and enjoy. Kids are our, our, our future of tomorrow. Amen. Even you were kids. <laughs> right? Okay, are you still with me? Yes. Thankfulness, God despises thanklessness. He killed Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, because they weren't thankful. He couldn't stand it. Always dissatisfied with what God gave. The offering wasn't good enough with the three-pronged prong with a fork. No, they wanted to pick what they wanted. They wanted their own. But yet, Adam, uh, David says, your boundaries have fallen in lovely places. I don't want another car or another house. I'm happy with the car I have. Thank you for what I do have. We always want something else. We should give, give thanks for what we have, be grateful. You know, yeah. so often we get something and then we want something else. <laughs> Let's give God thanks for what we have. Don't be dissatisfied and whine and complain. God finds it very attractive when we're humble and thankful. He loves it. He's drawn to thankful people. Right? The pure in heart shall see God. When your heart's right and you're thankful and, and you're humble before the Lord, He's drawn to you. Second thing is faith. You know, I'm not from a faith school or extreme faith, anything. I'm from a Jewish family and I've got born again. But the older I become, the more overwhelmingly persuaded I am that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Impossible. In fact, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? Now, let me tell you, family of God, your faith is under daily attack. All day. The devil's always thinking, what must I do to you to make you doubt there's really a God? There must be something I can do to make you think God's forgotten about you. I must be able to bring enough stress and difficulty and financial pressure and one thing that to go wrong, go wrong, that you think that God's abandoned you and there is no God. I must do something to you to take your faith. 
God, he said to God, you know that Job of yours, if you kill his wife and children, then he, won't, then he won't praise you. He was looking for a place that you wouldn't serve God. You know, you know don't you? Job said, if you even kill me, I'm still going still to trust you. He was devoted to the Lord. So in your walk, the devil's always, you know, I told, quoted earlier, Jesus said, the devil's asked to sift you, but I prayed for you. I prayed your faith wouldn't fail. When the devil's after you, when he attacks you, he's not after your house, your money, your car. What he's after is your faith. What happens, listen, listen, listen carefully. I'm giving you practice. I'm talking to you as if in my very own family. If the devil attacks you and you have a financial pressure, immediately the panic sets in. The moment you have fear or panic, faith's gone. If I can just get you to react or panic when someone calls you, someone, one of your family's in a car wreck, just somehow get you in a panic mode, then there's no faith. And then when you pray to God out of panic, fear, and anxiety, God doesn't respond to any of that. He responds to faith. It's faith that moves the mountain, not need. Faith moves the mountain. And you've got faith, but if I can get you in another frame of mind, full of fear or self-condemnation or feeling guilty, if I can do something to stop you believing me. Because Jesus said, you don't need a lot of faith. That's the wrong idea. Faith has to be as little as a mustard seed, but no doubt. If I can just get one fear, one doubt in there, if I can just get one thing in your head, just one, I can mess up your faith, no matter how much faith you have. Are you hearing me? He's so, he's so nervous that you're going to get this because you will move mountains. It's not about how good or holy you are. Let, let me tell you, let me tell you, get this now. You think the devil's told you because you're not a good Christian, and, you, and you're not. That's why Jesus saved you. Let's, let's, let's put that, devil, you're right, I'm redeemed, and that's all there is to it. I'm not going to fight about it. So understand, there was a woman, a Canaanite woman. Now, most of you don't study Bibles, so I'm going to help you. Canaanites were horrible people. They sacrificed their own babies to their foreign idols and built a massive reputation with the Jews that disliked them intensely. So Jesus is teaching in a certain area, and they, they retreat or go away to get, to get some rest. And a Canaanite woman has heard about him, and her child's very sick, and she needs a miracle. So she runs to find where he is, and she keeps calling to him, Son of David! Son of David! Help me! Help me! And so they keep ignoring, and the disciples say, please, can you send her away? Because I don't like him. And, and Jesus said to the disciples, I cannot minister to her. Because God told me I must only preach to the Jews. So I'm obeying my father. I'm not doing anything outside of the parameters that were given me. It's not their time. It's not their season, the Gentiles. And she kept on and on and on. She threw herself in front of him. Please help me with my child. Woman, I cannot give to the dogs what belongs to the children. And what that means is dogs means you're an unbeliever. You're outside of the house. And she said, even the dogs get the crumbs. You've got so much. You're so anointed of God that whatever's left over is enough for me. And when he, she said that, he said, we have great faith. The child's healed. He didn't heal his child because she was righteous. Oh, she was a Christian. She was a Jew. She was a good person. Went to church. But because she really believed. The devil is so frightened. You might really believe for that new job. For that healing. For that miracle. For the restoration. He's so afraid. You might get this. He's so scared. He'll keep you in a place of bondage. In case you get it. That you can start hurting him. Do you understand? So faith attracts God. God's attracted to people with faith. He finds it very amazing when people really believe what he says. Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith, not because of his, of his actions. In fact, everyone thinks Abraham's such a great guy, but he's a bit of an idiot if you ask me. <laughs> you all laugh, you've never heard that before. Well, let me tell you, if God Almighty tells him, do not take your father-in-law, which part of do not take your father-in-law was confusing? Because that's exactly what he did. He blatantly disobeyed the Lord. Then he tells the king, this is not my wife, it's my sister. His own wife, he lies about his own wife. And God says, my man, don't think so. But God counts him righteous because he believes what God said. He really believed it. It was so effective to the Lord. Number three. God is attracted to people that are generous. Now pay attention to me very carefully. You hear about giving all the time. And there's a spirit of poverty on our Hispanic community, which I despise. 
because we come from poverty or struggles and the community and our social climate tells us we have to be poor. A lot of nonsense. Let me tell you, I've preached several times in a church in Kentucky. And this church has been there for years. And the, and the previous pastor, same name as his son, they ministered to the inner city and the poverty people. And he asked the Lord, Lord, I want someone rich in my church, but I'm tired of just poor people. And the first wealthy man he ever got was a man who at 65 years old borrowed money from his second, second social security check. He borrowed money against it. And he did the one and only thing he could do. He was tired of being so poor and began to fry chicken. You've heard of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I know you have. He became a multimillionaire late in his life and began with nothing. So don't tell me I'm not educated. Don't tell me, ah, Mingo, I'm a, I'm a Mexicano. I don't, don't give me that nonsense. Because if God blesses you, there's not a devil in hell that can stop it. If you can just learn to walk straight and do what God says, he's going to come through for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Get that poverty mentality out of your head because God is not poor. That's right. That's right. God is not poor. I'm a living testimony. Ask my wife how many times we wondered, how is God going to help us? And God every time came through for us. Every time. We don't know how, where, or what. He always did never the same thing twice. Now, generosity. God is attracted not just to givers. We in America have this, have this handicap that we are generous tippers. We tip. Whether we give bags and have a haircut, restaurant, we tip. And we come to church and we tip. We put $2 in the envelope and put it in the basket and we're giving to God. We're saying, you're not giving to God, you're tipping. Because giving to God is, now listen, I'm not trying to get money out of you. I'm trying to teach you that you can prosper. Because I can tell you about years ago, four or five years ago, my, my daughter works for me, Charmaine, my, worked in the, did the books and she said to me, Dad, we're really in trouble. We've got no money. I'm, I have to go get a job. There's no money to pay salaries. We're in big trouble. I said, well, what do you have? He said, I've got $1,000. Wow, and I need much more than that. So I said, well, if it doesn't meet my need, it's got to be a seed. So I said, let's sell. Where can we sell it? And I sold it as quick as I can. And she just couldn't understand that. It was, it was, end, of, it was the end of September, end of August. And, the, the, and we didn't know how we were going to pay salaries. And a few days later, a little check this big. I got a little check this big, once, only once in my life, $100,000 in the mail. You remember that, don't you? It was, it was so stunning, even my bank didn't, when, they, when I handed in the bank, they put $10,000 instead of $100,000. They couldn't think that God would do that for me. And why I'm telling you that is, this is one incident, and it happened again, but God came. When you're at the very end, you feel like the devil's told you it's all over, you have to give it up. It's a lie. God has no, He's got a fish with a coin in the lake waiting for you to need it. Waiting for you to need it. I don't want you to struggle and be poor anymore. I want you to prosper. If God can't trust you with the money, He can't give it to you, and He can't afford to lose you, so He's watching what you do. Now, generosity is different. It's not just giving a tip. Because there was a man who was not a Christian. He was not a Jew. His name was Cornelius in Acts 10. And the Bible says he gave generously and he prayed often. And God saw this and he sent an angel to him. How many of you have seen an angel? Not many. But he saw an angel and he was so, what, what do you want here? He said, God says you're giving. And your prayers have come up as a memorial offering. God is so impressed with your... And I began to, what kind of, what is general, what, what, do you, what did he give? Well, when you give at your tip 20%, even 30, they think you're really a blessing. You give 50 or 100%, you got their attention. Yes. Yes. Do you understand? Generosity is giving way more than is expected of you or you think you can afford. When you give generously, you can feel it. Yes. It hurts. But in our American culture, when we tip, tip it doesn't hurt much. Yeah. We don't miss those few dollars. We've already programmed ourselves to give those few dollars. We can tip. Are you hearing me? You got very quiet in this place. You're not supposed to. Jesus said, the poor will always be among you. He never said to disciples, you, some of you will be poor. He said, they'll be among you so that you can prosper and minister to them. That they can give God glory for the works. Now, you can't give to someone if you don't have any. Come on now. Am I telling you the truth? So God is impressed by generosity. He's attracted to generous people. Number four, 
prayer and fasting, when people really pray and seek Him, and now let me tell you, fasting is not just not eating. If you don't eat all day and go to work, you're not fasting. That's just starving. <laughs> God's not impressed with that. If you fast and you pray, then you're now separating yourself. Rather fast a short time and give it all to God in prayer that you can really pray. But it stimulates your faith because that's what touches God is faith. When you're fasting, it gets you clear and spiritual and focused on the supernatural. Fasting does work. It's a God-given thing. It's a very healthy thing. Are you hearing me? Okay, so God responds to people and pray and seek and come near to God. James 4 verse 8 says, and he'll draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and don't mind, and purify your hearts. When you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found of you. God responds to people that seek him. My daughter asked me, Dad, what, how do you seek God? I said, glad you asked me. When your, mom's, when your mom wants a pair of shoes, she doesn't go to Home Depot. She goes to a shoe store because that's where shoes are. And you can't find it in the one shoe store, we'll go to the next, and the next, and the next, until I'm exhausted. And then, now we've got the internet, thank God for the internet. But before, she was so aware of shoes, I noticed she'll even know when she's greeting people in church. Hi, hi, hi. She'll tell me, that person's got the shoes on that I was looking for. I want to ask her where she got it from. She notices because she's looking, she's mindful of the shoes. When you're looking for God, you won't find him in the sports stadium or in the bars. If you're looking for God, you'll come to church. You'll look to all you can to find the time and the place. You'll do all you can to get there. You don't want to miss a darn thing. You're hungry for God and God responds to your hunger. Number five is obedience. God is so attracted to obedient people. David was a king and I've taught about David in this very church. How that David, I couldn't figure out what God could like about him. He was a throwback. He wasn't, don't know who his mom was. He may not even been Jewish for all I know. Red hair, red complexion. What you looks like that. Very strange looking man. And that's not enough. His brothers don't like him. His dad doesn't like him. His own son didn't like him. He had a bad parenting and he had a problem with women. He had 300 wives and concubines. That's got to get your interest somehow. Yeah. And still he wanted another man's wife knowing she's married. That's not a small thing. He loved God and wrote all these psalms and yet he pursued. He didn't fall the moment of weakness. No, he sent for her. Knowing she's married. Waiting for her to come. It wasn't just like a moment he couldn't control. No. And then once she makes, he makes her pregnant, she, he works it so her husband gets killed. He could have killed him himself. Same thing. And God says... Man of your own heart. I'm going, really God? But I found what God liked about him. Acts 13, 22 says, After removing Saul as king, God gave them David, saying, testifying, I found David, a man after my own heart, because he will do everything I ask him to. Amen. Is there anybody in this room that will do what God says? I tell you, all of us have a struggle to obey the Lord. All of us. The lowest on the totem pole of obedience is giving to God your tithe if you cannot tithe you will not obey God with spiritual things because tithing is ungodly mammon and the irony is he gave you that you didn't come here you didn't get born with a tithe you didn't get born with money you were born with naked and nothing it was all here waiting for you and you die it's all going to be here still so God gives you the seed to sow and he gives you the bread to eat but now we eat the bread and the seed And I'm telling you, sow, sow your seed. When I pass to the church, people said, I, have, I just haven't got the money. I've got so much debt. And I say, well, if you don't sow a portion of your, at least a portion of your tithe, you won't have any next month. And every single time, that they, within two, three months, they were tithing the whole thing and very blessed financially because it really works. God didn't give us tithing because he wants money to get your money out of you. It's for our benefit. God can make manna fall from heaven. He doesn't need us. It's our benefit. He wants to teach us obedience. Money changes people. It's the funniest commodity. If you are crazy and rich, they just call you eccentric. People treat other people because of money differently. You can be ugly, mean, rude, but if you have money, you're the man. People respect you. The same grave for rich and poor. Same grave. So if you can learn to 
get a lifestyle of obedience, it'll really help. Now, number six, God is drawn to the righteous, for his eyes are of the Lord on the righteous. Now, pay attention. I'm going to teach you something very valuable that might change your life. You are righteous already because of Christ. A gift. It's called imparted righteousness. It's imparted to you because Christ died for you in your stead. But there's another righteousness called imputed. And what that means is it's accredited to your account. Because Abraham was righteous because he believed what God said. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 10.41, Receive a prophet. As a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. The next verse says, Receive a righteous man. As a righteous man, you get a righteous man's reward. What is the reward of a righteous man? The reward of a righteous man is the fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. How it works in your life is when you need a miracle, you recruit people in the church you know will pray and really break through for you. You don't recruit the idiot in the church that can't pray or hardly serves the Lord. You're looking for someone that you know touches heaven. So those are the righteous people, and because you honor them because they're righteous, living, and this is different. It's not just righteous imparted to them. They're making a lifestyle of choosing to do what's right. Not all things are beneficial, though all things are allowable, the scripture says. And there are things in your life that are not sin, but they don't please the Lord. And when you start finding out what God wants you to do, and you start responding to Him, and you start hungering to do what's right, and shaking all things, you don't put the burden on them, well, you know, you can watch that, but I don't want to watch that stuff, it's not my, I don't care for it. And you don't have to put the burden on them, it's for you. And the more you adventure and Go down that road of making good, healthy, godly choices and choosing Him and what pleases Him more. You become more and more righteous and you become an absolute threat for the devil. The, the devil knows righteousness. He knows where you're walking with God. The sons of Sceva, they, they said to the, to the deep person that was demon-possessed, In the name of Jesus, who Paul serves, the devil said, Jesus I know and Paul, but who are you? They weren't afraid of using the name of Jesus. Who? Name of Jesus. No. Didn't threat. There wasn't the form. It didn't work. They had to be people of righteousness walking with God. The yeah. devil knows he's walking with God or not. You're just playing the game or if you're really walking with the Lord. And you can be serving God a long time but not righteous. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Little things. Paul says, coarse joking shouldn't come out of your mouth. When sometimes I make jokes that are just off color, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you should start feeling guilty and bad about that. You shouldn't be comfortable watching an R-rated movie. You shouldn't be comfortable with people talking dirty and, and foul mouth. And it should be make you, it should make you uncomfortable. It should make you feel grubby. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know you're righteous when you, or you're pursuing rights when you walk in the office and everyone gets quiet. You know what I'm talking about. Many of you here are more righteous than you think you are by your style of living. You ch keep choosing God. Even if you struggle and fall and make mistakes, you're choosing what's right. Amen. Because every one of us have temptation. Jesus was tempted with all things, the Bible says, He's able to secure us. Every one of us goes through stuff all the time. Are you hearing me? Yes. No one in this room is perfect. Nobody is perfect. Not even our pastor was close. Then just, he's just not perfect. Amen. All right. Number seven, God loves, is attracted to worshipers. He's looking, it's the only thing he's looking for. And don't think because we have got the best youth band in this side of Texas that, that now you can, you're a worshiper, you can sing with them. No, you're singing, you're not worshiping. If you don't worship God at home, or in your truck, or in your shower, you'll never worship God here. If you're afraid to raise your hands at work or in the elevator at work, if you're embarrassed to talk in tongues or tell people how wonderful Jesus is, you're never going to be worshipped here in the church. Never. You'll just sing. No matter how good they sing. William Branham said that there'd be a revival of worship in the latter part of last century. He said they'd worship a God they didn't pray to. Music has escalated and become wonderful, but unless you're a worshipper where God is, a, you and God alone, you can't worship Him here. He wants you to worship Him. People in spirit and in truth. The last thing is, he, God is attracted to those who really love Him. Not everyone loves God. Many people know the Lord and go to heaven. Not everyone loves the Lord. I am, I am drawn to people, black, white, fat, thin, old, young. When people love the Lord, I, I'm so drawn to them. 
because I love the Lord. I really love the Lord more than anything in this world. When you love God, it shows. It shows in your life. People can see it. You behave differently. You can't. I have difficulty understanding how Christians can continually behave a certain way. If you love the Lord and you spend time with Him, surely He gets in your face. Because whenever I walk into His presence in the Holy of Holies, I'm already apologizing because I know there's something I did wrong. And I always got to make right. And you know, the most, you know, God expects you to grow in righteousness. And as you become more like Christ, you learn how to forgive. But eventually you start taking the blame that's not even yours. And you're glad to, excited to do it. But you know the thrill it, that it thrills the Lord because he took blame it wasn't his. Most of you in this room now, you have the fight in your soul because you want to prove how right you are and they're wrong. And you're still way down the ladder still when it comes to righteousness. The more you walk with the Lord, the less you care who's right and wrong. In fact, you'll run to take the blame. Say, oh, just me, me. Wasn't you? And even though the person's starting to wonder, well, are you trying to be sarcastic now? Because they deep in their heart, they know. But if you really mean it from your heart, you take responsibility like you become, you become the lamb that was slain for his sake. You really take on the nature of Christ. And we need more Christians. We need them. We need the real things. And there's so many of you in this room that have this amazing potential. I've watched you over the years, really good people. God is with you. What can I say? God is with you. He's drawn to those that, that love him. He asked Simon, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. You don't feed God's sheep. You don't minister. You don't do things for God because you can, because there's a need, because pastor asked you, because you will get tired of it. You will get irritable. But if you love God, no matter what the sheep are like, and Lord Jesus, you've got some sheep now, let me tell you. You have white ones. You have black ones. You have fluffy ones. You have natty ones. You have ones that are always biting the other sheep, ones that are biting the shepherd. You have sheep that are wandering off, leaving the 99. You always got to go find them. Then you've got sheep that are always eating stuff you never gave them on the internet and you've got to deworm them every Sunday because they're so full of stuff and you want to send them down to the Methodist church. You're so tired of them. But if you love the Lord, it doesn't matter if they're doing good, if they love you back, it does not matter. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for Him. So I hope now with that compressed teaching, you're going to make an effort to be attractive to the Lord. You spend time putting on makeup. You spend time getting nicely dressed and look, taking care of your nails, ladies. Men, you do all you can to buff up and get more and more tattoos. Lord Jesus, help us. <laughs> Who needs clothes when you've got a body full of tattoos? <laughs> they call it a whole sleeve. I mean, really, what is that? You want to see my butterfly? Oh, guys, come on! The only tattoo I'll ever get in my life are eyebrows. So I've got none. I want you to be attracted to the Lord so He'll do things for you and be want to bless you. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I serve a live Christ, not a dead Muhammad. This, this year, things have changed. The enemy, because of the, of the new awakening, the enemy thought he could launch an attack against this church. And he's not done yet. He's going to always do something. You know, he's a liar. His main ministry, the devil's main ministry, Revelation says, he's the accuser of the brethren. He'll always accuse you of how bad you are. Then you'll accuse God of how God's letting you down. Then you'll accuse your other brethren and tell lies about them. He's an accuser. That's what he does. So I, don't, I want you to learn not to accuse. When, some, when you feel you want to tell your husband or wife, well, you never, you always do this. You're accusing them. Don't do it. Don't do it. Tell them how you feel, but don't accuse them. Because you're doing the work of the devil. That's his ministry. Right? Let me tell you, if there's power in your words... If you can start speaking what God's plan is, even if it doesn't, it doesn't feel good, you want to kill him, but you're a blessing. I'm so grateful for you. You're a wonderful husband, wonderful wife. I'm married to 40 years and got the best wife I ever had. 40 years. But the first few months I realized I'd done a 
strange thing, but she wasn't what I thought she'd be at, at all. And I was so disappointed. And I told her what a bad wife she was, and she said, well, if you were a better man, you would have got a better woman. <laughs> so if you think you haven't got what you want, you don't. God gives you what you need, not what you want. Your wants, your wants change every day, but his need is consistent in your life because he's got a purpose, an eternal purpose for you. Right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm waiting for the Holy Ghost. That's why I'm stalling. waiting for the Holy Ghost to speak to me. What's your name with the... That's not Spanish on the corner there. Nate. Sir? Nate. Nate. Nate? Short for? Nathaniel. Nathaniel. What a wonderful prophet name. Where are you from, Nathaniel? From Philly cheesesteak sandwich. Woohoo! I associate everything with food. Everything with food. If you ask me directions, go straight down to McDonald's, make a right. If you've gone, if you've gone to Wendy's, you've gone too far. If Wendy's is too far for you. Go all the way right down to Starbucks. Not the one across the, the one this side. Today we're driving with a pastor and every Starbucks I had to see. It was like a tour of Starbucks. Really old. It's called St. Arbucks. Hello. So, what do you do? Uh, what do you do for a living? You're a quality insurance damager. <laughs> You're a pastor. I see you have a heart for the Lord. You've, you're very tired. You've labored very hard, and you've not given up, but you've almost gotten really tired of so much stuff and begun to rethink your call. I'm here to tell you from the Lord that he's going to refresh your call. It hasn't changed and lift you up. You've just been plowing in the wrong field. People are people are people. No matter what color they are, or what culture they have, they're people that need saving. So whatever field God gives you, that's where you must work. You've been looking for a field that you thought was familiar to you, but God's got other people that need, need your help. The, the people that made you tired weren't the world. It was the Christians that made you tired. So you've got to forgive his bride and forgive the unwise ones that had said the wrong things and made your work very tough. Let go of it. You didn't fail. God just moved you on. In fact, Jesus sent the disciples out and said to them, when they don't receive you, dust your feet. He expected them to go through places that would just not receive that supernatural power at all. And that's happened in your life. And you need to shake it off, dust your feet. It's not you. Do you understand? It's not you. Time for you to move on. It's that simple. And I speak refreshing of your soul, of your flesh, of your being, that you can become strong again in the Lord. Because you get yourself out, you drag yourself out of bed each day, you've got no fire and zeal anymore. And that's not who you are. You have a load of wisdom and understanding and compassion. You're a good man. But you've gotten burnout. And burnout comes from, from doing what God didn't ask you to do and getting off track or not spending time with him and God's bringing you all back to that because he needs workers and you're a good worker you're a good worker in his kingdom do you understand he's called you to the down and outs and you'll pick him up in a hurry because God has given you a, a real anointing for it new day new day in your life where you work is only a provision for a temporary provision it won't stay this way God is doing an amazing thing in your family the devil's done all he can to destroy your family and it's been a really tough thing for you and God says watch what I'm going to do the devil's not going to triumph I have not forgotten about you do you understand God's got a new thing for you hallelujah So glad I serve a live Christ. Charlotte, who's the fellow with the beard next to you? Who's the fellow next to you with the beard? You don't know him? We took so you just, why are you staring at him like you don't know who he is? Tell me who his name is. Come on. Ricky Tricky. What do you do for a living, Ricky? What do you do for a living? You owe God. You should be dead. You did such stupid things, God had to rescue you. But the irony of it all is you have enormous potential. You never do anything half measure. It's always one extreme or the other. Your middle name should be extreme. 
And God's asking you to forgive in your own family when they tore your heart out. She was just a kid. You never completely recovered from that. You act tough and had to survive by yourself, but you were, your heart was torn out by someone who should have loved you, should have coached you, should have helped you. They tore your heart out because they were the broken themselves. But I'm here to tell you, you have a wonderful destiny. Wonderful. You're a powerful man, and God's got plans. You must just make the right decisions. You know what's right. I don't have to teach you or tell you. You know what's right. Do what's right. God has always had your back. He says, I must tell you to remind you, you know, you said someone's watching out for me repeatedly. Because every time when they should have had big trouble with the police, big trouble with life, your own life, each time God did something for you. Others went down a bad rabbit hole, not you. Each, and you said someone's looking out for me. Well, get it straight. It's true. God's got a destiny for your life. You feel to jump into your destiny and do it. Just do it. We don't want to hear any more of the bad childhood. We know everyone's got a story. We know you went through hell. We know it. But shake it off and become a man that will take the future and do what God's got for you. It's that simple. You have enormous potential. Enormous. And God's got a good plan for you. He's going to fix so many things. In fact, there's a, a legal record that's dangling over you all the time that's against you. You're not sure what you're going to do. The Lord Jesus is going to be your advocate, your lawyer. He's going to speak for you and clear it. So you'll be so shocked. They'll be shocked at what God's going to do. Homie. <laughs> you taught me that. I'm just following... My Linda example, <laughs> Lily, Lily and Lillian. <laughs> we go to a Chinese lady that does jewelry, and she can't say Linda, she says Lily, and, and she calls Lydia Lillian. <laughs> I never forgot that, it's always stayed with me for years, it stayed with me. All right, you're wearing a, a shirt with a star in it, is that cowboys? Surely not. You know you're in California, right? <laughs> so what's your name, sir? George of the jungle, as strong as he could be. Are you married, Uncle George? Do you know who to? Robin. You see, you did know. And how many children do you and Robin have? Now that's talking children. Where are the, where's your wife? With the children. Kids are grown. Why is she not here? Okay, we tell her I missed her tonight. Tell her that she's felt like she's burned the candle both ends and she's really tired and frustrated. But tell her that the Lord says everything is working together to good for good according to his purpose for those that love him. She's frustrated because she can't cope with so many things right now. It seems like one thing after another after another and it seems there's no break for her. Tell her that it's all working together and God's got a plan. He does love her. He's got a, he knows she's a very kind, generous woman. He knows. He's taking care of it. As for you, sir, you've been carrying a load too and you're kind of frustrated inside. You don't know what to do. You feel helpless. But the Lord is your strength. If you pray, God hears you. Just pray and give it to God. You cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. Are you in this church? If you're wearing a cowboy shirt, you have to be. <laughs> because your past is under the same delusion. He somehow, he s somehow thinks he's a Texan. If I wear a cowboy shirt, understand, I live in Texas. I've been there 20 years, but they don't live in Texas. Why do you wear a cowboy shirt? That doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to wear a cowboy shirt. They keep losing. I don't like losers. My Savior is a winner. He said, it's finished. And he was top of the hill. Right? right? right. Cowboys. Yeah. It's always a maybe next year. Maybe. No, please. I'm getting tired of it now. <laughs> and when they win, I'll be a Cowboys fan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you think I'm crazy, huh? It's loco. My father is loco. 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 So what's your name with a hoodie? The young guy with a hoodie on. Yes. Are you cold? Okay, now I would like that lady next to you and no, two other ladies, there. all four of you stand up quickly, please. Stand quickly. Pronto. Rapido. 
Por favor. Gracias. What's your name, the little short lady? <laughs> yes. Next to him, you're really short. Gina. Gina. Are you family of his? You're his mother. Were you 10 when you had him? <laughs> How old are you? How old are you, Gina's son? And what's your name? Anthony. So, Gina, how many children do you have? Just two? You don't know that we're looking for four in this church. Cinco is suma. It's just little, it's too few. Poco, it's a poco. Mas, mas chicas, por favor. So, where's your daughter? Stand up, daughter. Pretty little girl. Long hair, lovely. She has natural red hair? No way. Wow. Excuse me. So, Gina, what do you do? Are you in this church? You say you are, but I hear the Lord said you must lock it in. You've got to lock it in and know this is your family. It's more than just a place you go. This is your family. You had to fight so many battles and it seemed like you had to do it all by yourself. But you're not by yourself anymore. You've got family. Really, you've got three people that love you and are on your side. You go get them, girl, and they see you have so much ability and talent. You can do anything. You can make anything. You've got just an amazing little lady in many ways. And uh, you only have two kids, but you're very good with children. And you've had to survive such hardships. But this, is the, the, this future is so much more bright, so much more good things coming your way. Do you understand? Your son is Anthony, right? So you're wearing a hood because... You remind me of E.T. <laughs> Home. So what do you want to be when you grow up, Anthony? What do you want to be? Yeah, you would hear a lot better without that thing on you. An engineer. Now, Anthony, you have the ability. You're smart enough. You're just not always applying yourself. You're a little lazy. You wait for the last minute to do the project or the to learn or study, you want to do everything the last day. Ain't going to work, buddy. Ain't going to fly. You've got to change that. Do you want to hear me? But you are smart, and you're a little Prince Charming. You know how to talk if the birds out of the trees and all the girls like you. It is a total disaster. You know, leave the girls alone. There's trouble. I'm serious. You're 15. You're not 25. Yeah, I've got a knife. You must... You must focus on your studies. Honestly, you need to focus. You're going to design things more than build things. You're going to design things. That's what God's got planned for you. But you're not doing well the way you should do at school. You're, a, you're an A student. You should get straight A's. You're supposed to. Can you do that? All right. So, Gina, what do you do? You serve veterans. You said it, right? Like an office? Or what do you administer? Yeah. There's a promotion and an open door coming that's not really rightfully yours, but God wants to bless you because you've got great favor there and people trust you. People have been backbiting and gossiping and slandering all there about different one another and you can't stand that stuff. You just hate all that talk, talk, talk. God's put you there to be an upright, righteous woman that everyone respects. So just keep, just keep focused on you where God wants you, right? Your daughter's name is? Mia. Mia. And how old are you, Mia? Are you older than your brother? Does he get in your nerves? I would imagine. <laughs> Because you've got a different person. Would you play an instrument? You should do, because you're very musical. You should play several instruments, and God would like to use the music for his glory. You have a very set ways. You don't, you're, not, you're not as flexible. You know, leave me, this is my space. I don't tell me what to do. And you've got your own little independent ways. But you, the one major thing that's so good about you is you will finish what you start. You will do it. And, you, and you've gone through little traumas with friends and things, but you've learned how to cope with it, and you don't need people to like you. You're going to keep going. The college is definitely your future. It's not going to be easy, but you have to do it. It's important. Do you understand? You're kind of lonely now, but it will not stay that way. You got it? All right. You're going to speak another language that, you're not sp that you don't speak now. You learn a whole new language. Thank you. And they, they sit down, and I'll get the two. No, not you. Don't you sit down. I'm, no. Get yourself down, Anthony. What's your name with the green? Green lady. Alicia. Alicia. 
I, I know what Lisa is. I know exactly what it is. <laughs> I have a lady that comes to clean for me for years now, every, every once a week, and she doesn't speak a lick of English. I'm grateful I have iPhone, Google Translate. <laughs> All right. I would love to speak Spanish. It's the most spoken language in the world. Did you know that? The second most spoken language is French. The third is English. That's statistically facts. So, you married, Licia? Would you like to be? Just point and click. <laughs> Is there someone you like here? You, you're not dating anybody? You are? What, what's his name? <laughs> We're going to find out anyway. You might as well tell us. Derek. Is he born again? Very important. Mucho importante. <laughs> he has to be born again, otherwise we will have to send her, some of our elders over with bats and things to go and talk to him. Right? Because you know the Lord, right? You've got a good heart, good spirit, and do you've, um, you're so smart. But somehow, you're so trusting. Even today, you trust everybody. People have hurt you so many times because that you keep trusting everybody, but you think they, what they say is true. And God's teaching you, trust no one. Trust Him. Love them, trust Him. And God will help you. God's been repairing your finances. Don't give it out. People keep using you, using you, and you don't know how to say no. They come with long stories to borrow money. Just say no. Because God's saving up for a reason. You want, you've got a project you want to buy and establish yourself in a home. It's all going to take place, but keep going, right? Don't it? Because the devil keeps sending people to, with big needs, and they just, it's all a trick. They never pay it back. It's a lie. Because you're so soft natured. You think you're tough, but you're not. Soft natured. What's your name next to her? Are you family? You're the ex mother in law. It's like Ruth and Naomi. All the, the outlaws? Scary. Only in this church can find things like that. It's only in this church people get divorced and get remarried and still stay in this church. This is only in this church. So, so mother-in-law, ex-mother-in-law, what is your name? You act also very tough, but you're not. You're very soft-natured. You shed many tears, and you want to find your, find your worth in life, and God says he celebrates you so much because you're such a champion of so many ways. God loves you. You really are his little girl. He's so proud of you. In so many ways, you've had to sometimes scrape the barrel financially, but God always came through for you. He always made a way for you. There's a child that you pray for frequently that's always in trouble. And God says, I'm going to break those bands. Just keep praying. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. Keep praying because your prayers have helped before. Don't pray from a place of fear, but pray from a place of confidence and faith. Yes, yes. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You know, Charlie, even the, this little health issue that you're going through now, it's all attacked. The, the devil is so nervous of you. But you are going to another level even this year. You have already taken one step forward, but there's more levels you're going into this year supernaturally where you don't have to yell, like, you're not listening. You, you don't do any of that. But what's going to happen, the authority of God is going to be so powerful that you'll speak it out and it'll happen just like that. Because God's raising you to a real apostolic level of faith and confidence. And it's not because you want it or because you need it. It's because God chose it. It's that simple. There's so much is happening now in your life that's very different. A new day in your life. And so God's repositioning so many things, both of you. And you both are a great blessing. And he's, the devil's trying to stretch you as hard as he can in every which direction. Because he's nervous of what's about to happen. And what's really begun to unfold. And so God's bringing, he's going to, he, this is the time that God's going to pack the church. It was always his plan to have two services, always, always. And you're going to pack the house. You cannot do one service anymore. You have to do two, have to. 
and you'll have a different congregation, there'll be different kind of people. You know, one will be quieter, one will be more loud, it's that simple. And God will bless it, it, it God will take care of it. You'll get through this shingle thing, that's gonna, uh, you'll get through it, but the devil's not going to leave you alone, he'll attack you in every area, just recognize it for what it is. Don't, re don't react to it. Be full of confidence and faith. As for you, Linda, God's teaching you to call the finance in. I don't know why you have to call it in. You must speak to it and call it in. And other people in the church too, when they have financial need, just tell them, ask them how much you need and then pray that amount and call it in. Call it in. You've relied a lot of intercessors and prayer warriors in this church, but he wants to make you one that will speak, declare and speak in a spiritual authority too now. You got it? All right, Lillian. Lillian. Hallelujah. How much time do I have, Bishop? Little 11.30. There's no mercy. So you, his son, I heard. Yeah, and you've painted your arms. I hope it's just your arms, not every part. Just, just, I don't want to know anymore. Thank you. But just wondering. So how old are you? And what do you do? You work for who? What? Oh. To do what? To do what? What does that mean? Facilities. Was that hard to tell me? <laughs> You're very full of joy and fire in your soul and excited for the Lord. Don't lose that. Always protect that. Don't ever let the devil steal that from you. Do you understand? Because that will draw people to you. They'll ask you, why are you like that? And you tell them, because of the Lord. You've got a strong evangelistic anointing right now on you. And the Lord, are you in this church? Because Because what's going to happen, the youth is going to explode and you're going to be part of that reason why it's going to do that. You're going to just be bringing them in. Some of them really strange ones from out off the street because they will draw into your excitement and you can talk any language, any street language, you, you just can talk it all. And uh, you, you will. And God rescued you and you've had a real touch of God. What happened to you wasn't fake. It wasn't a momentary thing. It's a deep thing that God touched you. You can never go back to where you were, ever, because you're a changed man. Do you understand? And your relationships, the same thing. You're also very intense in relationships. Man, you can wear the poor girls down. You need to slow it down in all your relationships. Friends, all, all around, just slow it down and let the Lord be the one that, the most important person in your life. God's your provider and he's telling me he's got a car lined up for you because he'll provide for you financially. He's the source. He's got, he's got a plan. Just don't rush. You're all kind of fast. I see you a bit impulsive and you get ahead of God and even when he's telling you slow down, stop, you still keep going. It's like you don't hear God. And, I'm, and to think I'm making it all up. Uh, and <laughs> it's a funny thing, you're such a personality, he knows he's doing, he's in too hurry, he still keeps going. <clears throat> he's got a very kind heart, he's got a beautiful heart. You've always had a, a little boy too, you never had a mean heart, you didn't, you had no malice in you, you never would hurt anybody or do something on, on purpose, this is not who you are. You're very kind, you're very smart, you have your dad's brains, whose mom still has hers. <laughs> But the good, the good news is your dad's brains are very good. They have been, not been used at all. <clears throat> They're totally brand new. God has drawn, he's, God's attracted to the needy people, very needy. So, uh, God's got plans for you, one step at a time. Don't, don't rush to get there. I will warn you that if you can just get this one thing tonight from me, God doesn't move fast, but he does move suddenly. It seems like nothing's happening and you want to make it happen, just wait. Because all of a sudden, the thing will change. All of a sudden, just wait for God. To learn to wait for God. You will have the best journey with him ever. When you rush in there, you've got to redo some things every time, okay? You got it? He's got that silly grin like you used to have when you were a kid. Awesome, yeah. 
Yeah, God knows all about you is what I'm saying. <laughs> What's your name with the long hair and the green top and the little lady on the one, two, three, four, f yeah, the green, yeah. She, everyone knows it's you. Mm? Stand up. Stand up. What's your name? Jennifer. You thought no one will ever pick you, right? Well, that was a wrong thought. <laughs> and how old are you, Jennifer? 24, what do you do? You have a daycare? You have one? How many kids do you have that you have a daycare? You have five children already? Of your own? Oh. You have any kids of your own? Oh, thank you. Okay, where's your mom? What's her name? Rosalie. Rosalinda. God's healing her broken heart. You can tell her from me that the Lord has seen and moved with compassion. That she's suffered terribly and she's trying to still get over it. And he's, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to heal the broken heart and he wants to heal her. He will, he will not forget her. He's, he's all for her. Do you understand? You've walked a lonely road and you've kind of built a neat wall around yourself and out of anger because you've been disappointed so many times that you expect everyone to disappoint you and let you down even your friends, because no one keeps their word. It's not true. It's making you bitter. And that's not who you really are. You're very creative, you're very artistic, you're very musical. And God would like all of that for His glory, because you're an untapped treasure. Untapped. Do you not have a boyfriend? Because I'll tell you what, you are a, you are a, a treasure beyond treasure. I mean, you'd be an amazing wife. There's nothing you can't do. You've got so much love inside of you, and anybody who discovers you will be overwhelmed because you're more than anything they can imagine. You've got so much to give. You're a remarkable little lady. And God's got your back. He's got your back. I'm glad you chose the Lord because even through anger and bitterness you could have just gone away from the Lord but you keep choosing God and I'm thankful for that. You're not finished school. I see you have incompletes and you're going to finish some schooling in your life and you're going to really do well. It's going to qualify you on the level you need to be. And uh, you can't rescue the whole family. You can't fix everybody in the family. Everyone looks to you and you're always depending upon you and you have no life. But you've got to help everybody in the family. And that's not God's plan for you. So you've got to say no sometimes, okay? You got it? All right. And I, I'm going to look on, on christianmingle.com for you tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, come. Just a quick word from the sponsor. We're going to let our prophet take a break. Yes. I'm sorry? Oh, that's right. I'm so sorry. But I, I just, come on now, this is Pastor Lydia. And she's, uh, she's also my sister-in-law. And she's my, um, my wife's older sister. And, oh. And, no. Now I'm going to hit your shingles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I had a small outbreak of shingles. But my daughter works for a roofer. So when the doctor told me I had shingles, I called my daughter and I said, Charlene, she says, what, dad? I said, I need help. And she said, what's wrong, dad? I said, I've got, I've got the shingles, but I don't have a roofer. So I got <laughs> let, me, let, let me just share real quick uh, a testimony of what the prophet said on, on, on giving, and then I'll okay. give it to you. Um, before we moved into this building, we're on the other side of Whittier. And um, our rent there, we were leasing, and our rent there was $6,000 a month leasing. And that was the cheapest we could find at that time. My office at the time was in our house, a very, very small office. And our accountant, our church accountant, and, and my wife walked, in, walked into my little office one time and said, have you got a minute? And I said, sure. And the accountant said, Pastor, I said, yes. She said, we have $150 in the bank, right? It was $150 because we wrote two checks. So I said, okay. And she said, Pastor, I don't think you heard me. We have $150 in the bank. I said, okay. And my, said, my wife said, Charlie, I don't think you understand. That's all we have is $150 in the bank and our rent is coming in two weeks or one week, it was one week, we have to have $6,000. So I said, okay, here's what you do. 
I said, you find two families in the church, two families in the church that have a need and write them a check for $75 each. If we're going to go down, we're going to go down giving. Look at how God is. Look at how God is. We got more than enough for the rent in one week. God has placed us here. This building that God be glorified is paid for because, paid off. This building's paid off and God gets the glory because we've learned how to give. Amen. 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 I get to take the offering for the prophet. Now...